In the early hours of one September morning in 2008, there appeared on the doorstep of our home in South Kensington a brown-skinned man, haggard and gaunt, the ridges of his cheekbones set above an unkempt beard. He was in his late 40s or early 50s, I thought, and stood at six foot or so, about an inch shorter than me. He wore a Berghaus jacket whose Velcro straps hung about unclasped, and whose sleeves stopped short of his wrists, revealing a strip of paler skin above his right hand where he might once have worn a watch. His weathered hiking boots were fastened with unmatching laces, and from the bulging pockets of his cargo pants, the, edg the edges of unidentifiable objects peeked out. He wore a small backpack and a canvas duffel bag <coughs> rested on one end against the doorway. The man appeared to be in a state of some agitation, speaking as he was, not incoherently, but with a strident earnestness and evidently without regard for introductions, as if he were resuming a broken conversation. Moments passed without my interruption as I struggled to place something in his aspect that seemed familiar. But what seized me suddenly was a German name I had not heard in nearly two decades. At the time, the details of those moments did not impress themselves individually upon my consciousness. Only later, when I started to put things down on paper, did they give themselves up to the effort of recollection. My professional life has been spent in finance, a business concerned with fine points, such as the small movement in exchange rates on which the fate of millions of dollars or pounds or yen could hang. But I think it is fair to say that whatever professional success I have had, whatever professional success I had, owes less to an eye for detail, which is common enough in the financial sector, than it does to a grasp of the broad picture in which wide patterns emerge and altogether new business opportunities become visible. Yet in taking on the task of reporting my conversations with Zafar, of collating and presenting all the material he provided, including volumes of rich and extensive notebooks, and of following up with my own research where necessary. It is the matter of representing details that has most occupied me. The details, to be precise, of his story, which is, to risk putting it in such dramatic terms as Zaffa would deprecate, the story of the breaking of nations, war in the 21st century, marriage into the English aristocracy, and the mathematics of love. About 80 pages later, this, this, this chap who appeared at the doorstep of Anna he's telling the narrator a story. And he's, taking, he's taken us back, taken the narrator back, to an episode in his, in Zaffer's life, when at the age of, well, he says 12, but it turns out he was 10. At the age of 10, he was sent back from this country to Bangladesh <coughs> to meet someone very important to him. And that journey is fraught. In fact, we joined him after he has narrowly escaped death. He got off a train that had come to a stop at a bridge where the train driver had got off and talked to the locals about the, this, this bridge that didn't look quite robust enough for a train. And Zaffa decides just to walk across the bridge and join them when they come across. Uh, later, the train crashes into the river and um, from there, Zaffa makes his way to this village, at one point taking, hitting a ride with a UN jeep or Pajero, 
Something actually hangs on there. That's why I drew that distinction. Um, not here, though. So here we are. As the tangle of forest gave out to an open space, there came into view a long, wide field with the orderly appearance of cultivation. At its far end, it swept into a hillock on which there squatted a low tree <coughs> with long branches reaching out like the wires of an umbrella. Aubergines were, as I came to learn, grown in that field. And over the next four seasons, when they were chest high, I would help to harvest them. <coughs> to the side of the field, in a depression in the soil which was otherwise unmarked, was the grave of my grandfather. When King Fahd of Saudi Arabia died in 2005, he was buried the following day in an unmarked grave, in accordance with the austere practices of the dominant Wahhabi variety of Islam. Saudi Arabia did not declare a period of national mourning. The national flag was not lowered, and government offices did not close. The idea is that we return to God with nothing, each standing equal to others, death, the great leveler, treating king and pauper alike. At the other end of the spectrum, let me add, by the way, if you visit the Ottoman cemeteries in Istanbul, such as the vast grounds at Ayyub and Karakahmet, not only will you see elaborately carved steli marking the site of the Muslim dead, but you will also find many headstones topped with carvings of hats and headgear corresponding to the deceased's station in life the Pasha's Fez, the Janissary's Boar, and the Bashiks of Courtiers. Ottoman class was preserved in death, a heresy, presumably, in the eyes of Saudi Muslims. The hillock at the end of the field belonged, as I would learn, to the family. But it was where, with my grandfather's blessing, the local Hindus would bring their cows to die, in a part of the world where, historically, varieties of religious practices not just Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, but varieties within each carried on side by side. In fact, many intermingled to form syncretic faiths, which is apparent even today in the practices of Muslim Saletis in London. My own parents, I remember, once attended a convention of some visiting Hindu guru or swami held at Wembley Arena, and my mother used to visit Hindu fakirs in London to have her future foretold. All this is by the by, and indeed, I came, I came to learn these facts only later. And only later still would I grasp the significance of such things in the war of 1931. On emerging from the forest of bamboo then, I saw to my left the field and hillock, as I say. To my right was the hamlet. My body sensed imminent relief. And I could feel the sinews of my legs begin to yield to their tiredness. I approached the cluster of mud huts and shacks that comprised the family homestead, my grandfather's and his son's. Perhaps it was a kind of home. Something from infancy came down to me, not a memory, but an echo heard many years later. The moonlight threw a blue-white powder over the area and I saw the moon itself glancing off the taut skin of the pond, bursting on the leaves of the coconut trees, transfiguring them into torches of velvet green. From time to time, I could hear the somersaults of fishes in the pond, while all around, from everywhere and nowhere, came the croon of crickets, geckos, and tree frogs, fused into a purring song. A memory inside me was trying to wrestle its way through to consciousness, but to know that you once saw the same things, a landscape, a hamlet, and a house, in an altogether different way from how you see them now, and to know this without being able to recall the former memory itself, can cause a disembodying sensation. It is as if, over time, the self has divided in two. The mitosis of the man and his memory that leaves the boy parting from his infant self, and later the adult from the youth like the image of human evolution, from primate on all fours, through the savage half-man bent double, to the proud heir to earth homo sapiens, who walks tall, each man abandoning his predecessor, 
each stage only preparation for the next. And in the end, childhood left behind, put away. I saw then a form on the veranda of the main house, sitting on the step. I could make out a dash of long black hair, iridescent in the darkness, and the drape of a white sari over the bent form. The woman's head was nestled in her crossed arms, which braced her hunched up knees. She, had, she has not seen me, I thought. I stood there, taking in the gifts of my senses, crickets plucking the air, the forest rising behind the huts, the treetops knitting into the blue fa fabric of the night, one moon shimmering in the sky and another floating on the surface of the pond. I picked up a loose stone and tossed it into the pond to watch the water stripe, strike up in a vibrating luminosity <coughs> in remarkable geometric precision. The woman was now standing a few steps off the veranda, the whites of her eyes catching the light, her hair shiny. I tried to imagine how I must have looked to her, but I was so tired all I could see was my own body crumpling. We both walked, and when we met, we stood for a moment, each regarding the other. She was in her mid-twenties in those days, slender and beautiful, and I do not think I will ever forget the tenderness in her eyes. She lifted her hand to cup my cheek, and then curled it around the back of my head and pulled me into her breast, holding me tightly. My body gave way, and the exhaust, exhaustion from the day folded over me. This is how I began the next four years of my life in a village in the northeast corner of Bangladesh. They were the happiest years of my life, but they began with tears. <laughs>